Morning, Marin. Morning. Guys, it is Sunday. I am super stoked, as always, that it is Sunday because this is the Lord's Day that we can gather as Christian family. We can gather as brothers and sisters in the Lord. We can be fed by the Word of God and become more like Jesus. Amen? It's a glorious time. This is a glorious time. So we are in the book of Ezra. We are in chapter nine. Here's what we're gonna do. I'll pray. We'll recap where we've been and then where we're going in our text today. So Lord Jesus, you're gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, you are holy. You are other. You are set apart. You are altogether categorically different than we are. Lord, I pray that as we discuss your holiness, as we discuss your holiness as a people of God in our spousal choices, as we discuss your holiness as your character, Lord, I pray that you would make us more like yourself. Lord, please hide me behind the cross. Let the people of God hear the word of God and nothing else. It's in your good name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So we're in Ezra. We only got a few more we, we only have like one more week in Ezra before we're done. And then, uh, Pastor Steve mentioned this, we're in the Christ on the Cross series, answering big questions, most notably, what did the death of Jesus accomplish? So I'll give you a breakdown real quick of where we're going in the fall. September 11th, we're looking at Christ on the Cross. October, we're taking the entire month to talk about one of my favorite time periods of church history, the Reformation. We're gonna be looking at the five solas of the Reformation. Then we're gonna back to Christ and the cross. And then during Christmas, we're gonna be talking about the advent, the coming of Jesus. So just giving a precursor of where we're going in the fall. So let's recap where we've been in Ezra. So this whole book is about the faithfulness of God to his people. So Ezra shows up on the scene in chapter 7. He, he's put it in his heart to teach and preach the word of God for the people of God. The king Artaxerxes is radically generous with Ezra as he sends him back to the city of Jerusalem. Gives him blank check, whatever you need. You need, you need money, we got money. You need books, we got books. Whatever you need. And the king charges him to cause a spiritual reformation teach and preach the word of God, and then have a societal reformation that would come after that. The, the word of God wouldn't just stay here, but would go here and everywhere else. Amen? So what we see is Ezra praying and fasting, grabbing and gathering men. We've seen them stop before they the people of God, as Ezra's gathered them, to move them to the city of Jerusalem. They fasted and prayed for safe passage. And then last week, we've seen Ezra entrust the offering, this great offering from the king to the people of God, and then them delivering this to the city of Jerusalem. This sounds great, right? We wish the book stopped here. No, we don't. But it would be great if it did, right? This is a high point. Well, this week, brothers and sisters, we are going to see a very bad point for the people of God. I'll make this side point. All of the Christian walk, all of the Christian walk is peaks and valleys. Amen. There's high points in ministry and there's high points in life. And then there are very low points. Amen. We're going to look at a low point for the people of God this morning. So with me in your Bibles, turn to Ezra 9. After these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land with their abominations from the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perzites and the Jebusites and the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Egyptians and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be their wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has been mixed itself with the people of the peoples of the land. And in this faithlessness, the hands of the officials and the chief men has been foremost. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garments and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. 
Then all who trembled at the word of God, the word of the God of Israel, because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles, gathered around me whilst I was appalled until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting and my garments and my cloak, and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees, and spread out my hands to the Lord my God, saying, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you. My God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. For the days, from the days of our fathers to, the, to this day, we have been great, we have been in great guilt, and for our iniquities, we for our iniquities, we, our kings, our priests, have been given to the hands of the kings of the land, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, to utter shame, as it is today. But now, for a brief moment of favor, has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within his holy place, that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviling in our reviving in our slavery for we are slaves yet our god has not forsaken us in our slavery but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of persia to grant us some reviving to set up the house of our god in repair it's in to repair its ruins and to give us protection in judea and jerusalem and now O oh our god what shall we say after this for we have forsaken your commandments we, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying the land that you are entering to take possession of it is the land impure with the impurity of the people, peoples of the land, with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore, do not give your son, daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons. Never seek their peace or prosperity that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. After all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less, less than our iniquity deserves and have given us such a remnant as this, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would not... Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, you are just for we are left for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, you are before we are before you in our guilt and for none who can stand before you because of this. Brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord. There is a lot here. Let's start with our first section. I want to find that. So this portion of scripture, it, it previously in our story, it, everything looks good. They're in Jerusalem. We would think, yes, amen. Good. Go do it. There's problems. We find out on this scene, Ezra finds out something devastating about the people of God. So what does Ezra find out? Ezra finds out that the priests, the people, and the priests have taken foreign wives. Now, I want to point this out. This is bad. This is bad. This is real bad. It's like you saying, hey, I bought a brand new house, but there's a hole in the foundation. That's bad, right? That's real bad. Or like saying, I got this brand new car. There's an engine problem. That's a real problem. That's a real bad thing. This is, out of all the things the people of God could have done, this ranks up there as some of the worst. Now, why is this a problem? I want to point this out. This is a problem for two major reasons. One, one major reason this is a problem is the people of God are not taking the word of God seriously. The people of God are not taking the word of God seriously. This practice of intermarrying between different, uh, different religious groups. And I want to point this out too. When he says we're the holy race and stuff like that, that's not an ethnic thing in the terms of how we think of ethnicity, like skin color and things like that. This is people of a different religion. 
This is like Christian and pagan or Jew and Christian. Like this is intermingling something that ought not to be intermingled. This is expressly forbidden in the law of God. Now, we'll notice here that when Ezra sees, or we'll see this in Ezra's lament when he starts quoting the prophets, he actually brings up Deuteronomy, that he laments about what the people have done, right? He mentions this in the prophets, right? In the scriptures. Very interestingly, too, he mentions the people that brings this to his attention as those all who tremble at the words of the God of Israel. Right, the people that bring this to Ezra's attention clearly love the scriptures and believe the scriptures, right? So you know what the byproduct of the, the, the converse of that is, right? If the people that are not doing this, the people that are like, we can marry her. She's, she, we can marry her, this is fine. She might not love Jesus. No, 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 no. Those people don't respect the word of God. Those people don't listen to the words of God. Does that make sense? Where we're going with this. Now, you know what makes this an even more serious problem? Like, this is bad. You know what makes this even worse? This is the, this is the ice cream sundae with the, the whipped cream and the cherry on top. And you're like, this, that's even worse. What makes this worse is this is not the average Joe. This is not the guy in the pew that's making this mistake. This is not the guy, this is not the regular dude in Israel that's like, huh, okay. This is the priests. These are the leaders. These are the people that should know better. It's the chief priests and the leaders who are the worst offenders, according to these, according to these brothers. The priests were the keepers of God's word and were instruct and to were instru they were to instruct the people of God in the word of God. Now I want to point something out really important. If these people were not going to respect the word of God, the average Joe wasn't going to respect the word of God. Think about that. This is, I'll give you an example of what this is like. This is like a pastor who doesn't take the word of God seriously. And then, like, as a pastor, if you don't take the word of God seriously, no one else takes you seriously. Like, the reason why people, that, the reason why you should believe what I say is not because it's my personal opinion, but because it's the word of God. Now, here's the thing, locus, there's a thing called locus of authority. We discussed this in seminary when I, was, when, when, I was, when I went to school. The reason why you believe what someone says is not because it's their opinion, but because it should be the word of God. The moment, I, I've talked about this about preaching. The moment I step away from the word of God and I'm over here somewhere and off in like left field is the moment you should just, okay, turn them off, just mute. The moment you get back to the word of God, that's when you listen. Because the word of God has the authority in it. Amen? It's not men's authority. It's God's authority. It's the word of God. Now, pastors that do this, pastors that do this, and I'll give you examples of this. Like, I was driving home one day, and there are some very liberal churches in our area, most notably one down the street. I don't even know what the name of it is. I just know they have a gigantic rainbow flag out in front. They have a rainbow flag and they have these little signs that me and my buddies wanted to steal. That were, I'm being honest there. They were joking around. We're like, we should just grab them and change them. Like, we believe that love is love and this and that. Like, we were going to put like, we believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God. We were going to take the, just, we were going to evangelize, okay? I'm, <laughs> we were going to evangelize. That's what we're, sorry, that was funny. But it completely destroyed, what happens here though? It completely destroys the weight of anyone's argument. There's three things of argumentation. There's the ethos, pathos, logos, right? What you say, what your argumentation, how people feel, the pathos, and then the ethnos, the ethos of your actual credibility, like your words matching your actions. When nobody, when a pastor doesn't believe the word of God and they try to proclaim the word of God, and they see the glaring problem in their life. Nobody believes them. Amen? Amen? I see this a lot when pastors get caught in heinous sins. There was a story last year or the year before, things kind of meld together, of a, 
of a well-known evangelist, a man by the name of Ravi Zacharias. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but it came out that he was doing some pretty illicit things and his whole ministry got drawn into question. Like everything the man ever said got drawn into question. This is the reason why we must be holy. Now there's some practical applications for us as well that with, with holiness here. The fir, or with, with, the, with the scriptures first. The first descent into spiritual problems, brothers and sisters, is a low view of scripture. The reason why these people were were falling, not falling, but running headlong into this era of intermarrying with pagans is because they didn't take the scriptures seriously. Now, the first, the, the, the next symptoms, right? So this is the problem, not taking the scriptures seriously. The next symptoms of this always are different. They're always different. Like the symptoms of the problem, like the symptoms of the disease are not necessarily disease itself, right? You have a rhinovirus like coursing through or you got COVID or what, 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 whatever disease you want to pick. The disease produces symptoms, right? So if you have like a rhinovirus, like the common cold, you're going to have... Uh, you're going to cough, sore throat, this kind of stuff. The, the symptoms are going to come from the disease, not the other way around. Make sense? So having a low view of scripture produces symptoms, right? I'll give you some examples. Although these, these symptoms change, like false doctrine, right? People intermarrying with pagans is a symptom of not taking scripture seriously. Sinful practices, lust, uh, lo sinful practices like lust or people getting involved like Zacharias and like sexual sins and stuff like that all come from a low view of scripture. This is why Paul tells Timothy in the New Testament that they should watch his life and his doctrine. It's both and. It is your life, your practice, your doctrine, what you believe. They both need to be consistent. Amen? Amen. So why is this the case? Why do they need to be consistent? Well, Scripture is the foundation for which we know things about God. Amen? Amen. So when the foundation breaks, the whole building breaks. Like when we said the foundation of the, like we said, I got a brand new house, but the foundation is jacked up. That house ain't going to last. Amen? That house ain't going to last at all. So another reason why this is bad. This is bad because of what it jeopardizes. This jeopardizes the spiritual reformation of the people of God. Without a spiritual reformation, there is no social reformation. Without a spiritual reformation, brothers and sisters, there is no social reformation. Belief. Our beliefs in God, our, our religious practices impact society. Amen? So why is this the case? Why, why would this jeopardize the people of God getting steeped in heinous sin? Why would this jeopardize this? Well, you can't do the work of the Lord if you're steeped in sin. I'm just going to say it bluntly. I'm going to say it honestly. I'm going to say it earnestly. Say it with tears in my eyes. You can't do the work of the Lord if you are steeped in sin. Why? Why can't you do the work of the Lord? Well, one, it's blatant hypocrisy. Your beliefs, your behavior, deny, your, your behavior means, you, you, your behavior is not consistent with your beliefs. It means showing you to be a blatant hypocrite. The other thing too, God is not just an idea. God is not an idea. God is not like an intellectual. God is a person, three persons actually, Father, Son, and Spirit. Living entity. This makes him very mad. This angers the Lord. The, more on this when we see the anger of God and the justice of God when we get to Ezra's prayer. So I want to make an application for us while we're looking at the holiness of God. We need to take holiness seriously as a people of God. We need to take holiness seriously. Because, well, why? It's the only way that we're going to have, it's the only way we're going to start, sustain, and go through a spiritual reformation. It's the only way. Holiness of taking the, the word of God seriously, having that impact our beliefs, having that impact our emotions, and that our heads, our heart, and our hands, that's the only way that that's going to happen. Now, 
as we call the culture to repentance, if we're hypocrites, if we're inconsistent with the word of God, do you know what, you know what bothers people within the, typically, you know what bothers most Christians about the culture? Their, their sin, right? The thing that drives most Christians nuts about the culture and the most glaring examples of the culture not being where it should be is their sin, right? The LGBT, QRS, TUV stuff, the whole transgender, boys can be girls, girls can be boys, girls can be a cat, whatever. I mean, what kind of nonsense we're seeing now? All of that is sin. All of that's sin. The thing that the symptom of the problem is this the, the thing that's causing us so much grief is the sin. Now, if we partake in the sin, we lose our moral credibility to call the culture to repentance, right? I can't bust you for something I'm doing, at least not consistently. I can't look at you and be like, don't commit adultery on your wife if I'm doing it. Like you, you lose all of your all of your credibility, right? So the question is, where does holiness start? Where does holiness start? I'm going to be honest. It starts with the people of God. Judgment begins with the house of God. So this starts in church. This is not exhaustive, but it starts in church. We have elders and deacons being holy men who disciple others to be holy, right? Your elders, your deacons are here to serve and equip the people of God. We are here to gather with the gospel. We are here to equip. We're here to motivate. We're here to send, gather, equip, motivate, send with the gospel, with the story and glory of God. Amen? Amen. Gems, right? I love that acronym. That we're gathering, motivating, equipping, gathering, equipping, motivating, and sending with the gospel. So it starts in church. This is a side note, but this is one of the reasons why we, we here at Berean practice church discipline. Because we take the commands of our Lord seriously. We do church discipline at Berean for a reason. That's also one of the reasons because we stress church discipline, we also stress church membership. Like one of the things we were going to do this morning is welcome someone into membership in the body through baptism. Like being born in a family. Like buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. He's not just being, our brother is not just going to be baptized into Christ. He's going to be baptized into our church. He's going to be a member of our church. Awesome. Awesome picture here. So holiness starts in the church. Holiness also starts at home. I want to point this out because this is incredibly, incredibly important. Moms and dads being godly in the home have a bigger impact on the holiness and lifestyle of your kids than I do. I'm just going to be straight with you. Kids can smell hypocrisy a mile away, right? Kids can smell hypocrisy a mile away. Now, your mess ups in your home, your ungodliness in your home will be magnified with your children. Does that scare you? It should. It should. I have one that I have one to my shame. Side note, beware of any pastor who's the hero of their own stories. Beware of a pastor who's the hero of their own stories. Let me tell you how I screwed up. So in 2016, which is five years ago, I just started seminary. We don't, I don't typically like to go to things at other churches. I just don't. I, not that I don't love, my wife's laughing because she knows where this is going. She knows the story that's coming. I don't like to go to things with other churches, especially churches that like, I don't agree with doctrinal statements and stuff like that. Cause it just doesn't work for me. Like it's going to come up and I'm like, eh. so we get this bright idea that we're going to do this Halloween trunk or treat thing. We're like, okay, we're, we're going to take the kids around, get some candy. It's going to be great. I'm like, I don't want to do this, but we'll do it. It's okay. Fine. We'll just, that's okay. So we get to this church and it's, it's not exactly what we were expecting. It was like a harvest party. We were the only non, we were the only non members of that church there. There's like 10 people there. There's like 10 people and they're like, hey, kids are grabbing my kids off to, and I'm freaked out because this is kind of a heretical church anyway. We're just here for free candy. We were here. I mean, you knock on someone's door, you get free candy. I'm like, we're just here for candy and we were going to roll. We were going to like ding dong ditch with like candy. <laughs> like that was our game plan. Didn't work so great. So I'm sitting here freaking out because I have no idea what's about. To, I'm like, okay, they're going to teach my kids this and I'm going to get out of here. So 
I look at my wife and we have a code word, which I'm not going to say publicly, about when we need to get out of a certain situation. Some people have a look, we have a code word, we have a safe word, that if we say in the middle of a situation, you know we gotta get out of there. Can't say that, because <laughs> can't say what that is, in case we ever need it. So, <laughs> it's the truth, it's the truth. So I'm sitting here trying to get out of this horrible situation. I'm like, I do the only thing logically I can think of. I fake a phone call, right? I fake a phone call and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, boss, my phone's not even on. You can tell. I'm like, okay, cool, yeah, oh, I gotta come in? Okay, cool. Sorry, guys, I gotta go in, I gotta go into work. I, I'm, I was an accountant. That was not, a, that, was, that was a complete bullface lie. I had to get out of that situation. We get in the car. And my daughter, this is five years ago, mind you. Five years ago, my daughter's age is by three or fourth time. She looks over and she goes, Daddy, you lied. I'm like, yeah, baby, Daddy lied. Daddy lied. Daddy, Daddy's sorry. Daddy's a sinner and I'm repenting before. You know what? She has not let go for five years. <laughs> Daddy, you lied at Halloween. This, this, <laughs> It's burned into her cerebellum. <laughs> burned back, back, back here. It's like... My, and here's, the, here's my shame. I should have been a man and just said, we need to get out of here. I should have done that. I failed. I messed up. My ungodliness caused my little, stuck with my little girl. My mistake was magnified. I've repented before the Lord. I've repented before my family. I've repented and, and sought to live more godly life. But here's the truth. My mess up was magnified in her little heart. And she remembers that. She remembers that. And won't let it go. So we got to talk about forgiveness with her. But so we're working on that. But I'm just stressing. Your sin gets magnified with your kids. Because your kids see you on a regular basis. Your kids see you better than anyone else does. So judgment, brothers and sisters, starts with the house of the Lord. So how does Ezra respond? Note there's several ways in which Ezra responds, a, responds after finding this out. I want to focus two different aspects of his response here. His initial response and then what he does after finding out this horrible news. So what does he do initially? Well, he's appalled. Ezra is appalled. This is bad with what's going on with Ezra. Now, the word appalled here, the Hebrew connotation gives the connotation of emotional devastation. It can be translated desolated or destroyed. He's destroyed. Why might he be destroyed emotionally? Why might Ezra be destroyed emotionally? Well, we actually find this out later in the chapter when he, when he repents for the people of God before the Lord. He understands the holiness of God. He's emotionally destroyed because he's probably scared. He's appalled that the people of God would do this. And he understands the holiness of God and the justice of God and knows, oh man, our sins... God took us out of the land because of our sins. God judged us because of our sins. If we're sinning again, the Lord could judge us and will judge us because he is holy. Now, what does this cause Ezra to do? Well, he tears his clothes. He pulls out his hair and he pulls out his beard. Ezra clearly has more hair than me because if I pull out the little strands right here, I'm going to be bald. I'm just telling you, I don't got a whole lot there. Now, why does he do this? Well, this is to show disgust and to show he was seriously grieved about his sin. So in their culture, one of the common ways in which people showed disgust or people, you said something blasphemous and horrible, they would rip their clothing, right? We actually see this in Acts 14. This, this practice stayed all the way until the time of the apostles. We see Barnabas and Saul in Acts 14 getting mistaken for Zeus and Hermes. And you know what they do? They rent their clothes. They tear them. It's like, it's like Hulk Hogan. No, not like Hulk Hogan. That was a joke. But the point is, this was a very common practice in their day to show that they were disgusted at what just went on. So he tears his clothes. He tears his hair out of his head and his beard because he is emotionally destroyed that the people of God would do this. So what else does he do? 
Well, in verse 5, we find out that it says, And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garments and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees. So clearly, Ezra was fasting. The moment he sees this, he's fasting. He, this is... This matter is so grievous that he needs wisdom on how to proceed. Now, imagine yourself in this position, brothers and sisters. You're in a situation that requires, so needs wisdom. It is a bad situation. You have no idea how to get out of it. You fast. You pray. You, you, you're desperate for the Lord to give you answers to what you need. You're desperate. So this is why he fasts. So like... We mentioned this a few weeks ago about what is fasting. Fasting is when you forsake food for a time and devote yourself to prayer. You devote yourself to prayer. It sharpens your spiritual senses and shows that you have a greater need than your physical food. This is where Ezra is right now. Ezra needs God's wisdom to help him figure out what to do. He needs the wisdom of God to help him to, to make decisions. He needs the wisdom of God because he understands the holiness of God. For the people of God have not obeyed the word of God and understands the judgment of God is coming. Amen. Now, there's another important thing Ezra does as we look at the rest of this text. He doesn't just tear his clothes. He doesn't have just an emotional problem. He doesn't just, he doesn't just fast. But that fasting and that emotional distress culminates into something important, into prayer for the people of God. Ezra took the problem to the one who could fix it. That's what we do, brothers and sisters, when we pray. When we pray, you are bringing your problem before the one who can fix all things. There is nothing, brothers and sisters, so broken that God cannot fix it. God can fix anything by his, power and his, by his power and his mercy. I want to stress this because when we're, when we're freaked out about life, when you have problems, real problems in your life, your kids walked away from Christ. You've been diagnosed with a terminal disease. When there's no money in the bank account, you have uh, food that you need to buy. You have children at home. You have a wheel bearing that blows out on your van from the way home from taking your kids on an overnight trip. Sorry, that was a personal example because that really did happen yesterday. <laughs> really did. We were driving home from taking the kids. Our vacation got ruined this year. So we took them on an overnight trip on a hotel and we were driving home and the wheel bearing literally started squealing like a pig. It was like, Arr! I'm like, that's not good. That's not good. But God will get us through. God will get us through. And God got us through. God got us home. Glory to God. But when you have a real problem, like when I had a real problem with this wheel bearing, you know what the first thing, first response I had initially, we got to pray. We're going to get home. We're going to pray. And God was gracious to us and let us get home. When you have real problems in your life, the first place you should go is prayer. The first place we should go is prayer. That shouldn't be a last ditch effort. That should be the first, that should be stop one on the stops to solutions. Now, Ezra's prayer before the Lord. I want to walk through his prayer for us and show, it, show us how this might bless us. So in verse six, we see, the first thing we see is emotional honesty before the Lord. First thing we see is emotional honesty before the Lord. Ezra says, oh my God, I am ashamed and I blush to lift my face to you. My God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. He is emotionally honest before the Lord. I'm going to say this too as a side note, brothers and sisters. When you pray before the Lord, don't be fake. Don't be fake. I know so, I've seen this so many times with people when they pray. Like, everything is great. Everything is wonderful. When in all actuality, everything is terrible and they just want to cry. God knows your emotions. We can be honest with the Lord, right? We don't have to lie. We don't have to come falsely before him and saying, God, everything's great, but, but... God, I'm emotionally devastated about my sin. Lord, I am emotionally devastated about this horrible situation you're bringing me through. I don't have the energy to get up. My iniquity is above my head. I feel like I'm going to die. You can be honest with the Lord. 
If your situation is bad, you can be honest with the Lord. And then the other thing too, if your situation is great and you're bringing your situation before the Lord, bring that. Be emotionally honest when you pray. You don't have to, we don't, here's what drives me nuts sometimes about Christians. This drives me nuts. We pretend that everything is okay when really it's not, right? Like when we ask the question like at church, how are you? The real answer, when I ask you how you are, like, hey, how are you? I am legitimately asking, how are you? There is no expected thing of, I, I mean, hey, I'm fine, I'm great. I'm legitimately asking, how are you? If that answer is terrible, you can give me a real answer of, Pastor John, it's terrible. Give me the real answer. That's what I'm asking. When other people are asking you, how are you? Give them the real answer. That we're a church. We bear one another's burdens. Amen? Amen. So let's be emotionally honest with God and let's be emotionally honest with each other. Now, the other thing he does in verse 7 to 9, he retells the, God's faithfulness to his people. He retells God's faithfulness to his people. He acknowledges the sin that drove them out of the land. He is very clear about what their fathers did, about what his fathers did. That they were guilty before the Lord because of their sins. God's judgment was on them and drove them out of the land for their sins. Now, I want to point this out, too, because he's using language in this section like we and us and our, right, to describe the sins of his fathers, right? He is putting himself in the same situation because they are in a very same situation as the people of God were back then. He is lumping them all together as sinners. Now, I want to make an important note about this because I read three commentaries and wanted to pull my beard out and my hair out. And I couldn't do that because I don't have a lot of it. But I wanted to scream this week at some of the crazy people that have said things about this text. I have to explain this because we have a thing in our modern context of people repenting for the sins of their ancestors, which is stupid. In our modern context, especially false Christians are asking people to repent of the sins that their ancestors have committed or whatever. We don't do that. We repent for our own sins. We are judged for our own sins. Now, Ezra, when he is using the words of us or we, he is putting himself in the same category. Not that he is taking their blame, but he's putting himself in the same category as the sinners of old. Now, he's remembering God's and he's he's remembering God's faithfulness to his people and he's also contrasting that with the current grace that they're receiving. God had shown them mercy in our text by bringing them back to the land. God had brought them back to the land, gave them favor with Cyprus. He says here the favor with the Persians. God provided everything they needed for the temple. There was nothing that they needed that God withheld from them. They needed, they needed wood. They got wood. They needed stone. They got stone. They got everything they needed. And you know what Ezra is painfully aware of who that came from? It wasn't from the Persians. It was from God. It was from God. He acknowledges God's current faithfulness to his people. He says they were slaves, but God was preserving them, right? God is, he's acknowledging the sovereignty of God over their situation, acknowledging his gracious provision with their, of their current situation. Now, very interestingly, in verse 10 to 15, Ezra is pointing out their current situation before the Lord, right? He mentions the past. He says, our father sinned before you, Lord. You drove them out of the land. And currently you've brought us back to this land for your glory and our good. Now, he prays for this current situation. He says, now, oh my God, now and now, oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you have commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying in the land that you, that you are entering to take possession of it, is the land is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the land and with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. He's acknowledging their current situation before the Lord. He's acknowledging that they are taking foreign wives. No, side note here. This is very similar to what their fathers did. 
Their fathers, the reason why they got drove out of the land in the first place was because they partook in paganism. Was because they did not listen to the commands of their God and God brought judgment on them. Very important here. Now, I think it's interesting that in verse 10, the verse that I just, one of the verses I just read, he acknowledges, Ezra acknowledges the current grace that they're experiencing of coming back to the land is almost like spitting in the face of God. God has been so gracious to us, so kind to us. How could we possibly repair his grace with evil? How could we possibly do that? Now, with him acknowledging their current situation and them taking foreign wives, I want to circle back to this. This is a clear violation of the word of God. And I want to get into why this was forbidden in the first place. Like I said, their fathers did the same thing, right? They partook in paganism. They partook in the offerings and sacrificed their children to Molech. This is bad. Why did this happen in the first place? Well, it comes back to why God said don't intermarry with pagans. It turns the heart of the people toward false, false gods. It turns the heart of the people toward false gods. And I know in our modern context saying you won't date, marry, hang, like you won't consider relationships with people that are of different religions sounds intolerant or whatever. I don't care. But the point is, this is actually a safety precaution for the people of God. This is a safety precaution. We should take this command seriously. We should take this very seriously because when you marry someone, this is the most, you, when you're married to someone, you share the most intimate things, most intimate details of your life with that other person. If you don't share your religious convictions with that person and you're not, you don't have the same yoking religiously, you're in for problems. You're in for massive problems. This was forbidden in Deuteronomy 7, 3 to 5. This is the exact portion that Ezra is quoting here. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash to pieces their pillars and chop down their ashram and burn their carved images with fire. You don't make peace with paganism. You don't, t you don't play with false gods. You don't partake in their worship. You don't take those false weirdo pagans for, for your daughters. You don't take them for your sons. No, you don't mix, uh, you don't mix purity with paganism. You just don't, right? I'll give an example of this. This is a side note. Like one of the things my kids got invited to go do was yoga. We don't do yoga. You know why? Yoga is the Hindu form of worship. I know it's like a secular version of yoga, but we don't do yoga. We don't mix. We're Christians. We're consistently Christians. We don't do that. So we don't mix with pagans. Now, I want to make an important applications here, especially if you're younger or especially if you're an older, if you're a parent with children. This is... This same command of not marrying people of a different religion is with for Christians as well. Christians are commanded to only marry Christians. Paul brings this up in the New Testament of being unequally yoked with non-believers. In 1 Corinthians 7.39, he's talking about uh, after a wife, or after a husband dies and leaves a wife. It says 39, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is free to marry whoever she wishes only in the Lord. Only in the Lord. He br further brings this on in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. Do not be unequally yoked with non-believers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What, according, what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? 
For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will make my dwelling among you and walk among you and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. I'm going to make an important note here. Every time I have ever seen a Christian date or marry a non-Christian, it has always ended badly. I knew a dude when I was in college, this is a true story. He got so broken up over the non-Christian pagan girl. He was, he lost his mind over this. Like I have seen men walk away from Christ because they're like, well, I can't do this. I can't do the Jesus thing and date her. Well, you really didn't love, if, if that's the case, your, your first love isn't toward Christ. Your first love is toward uh, her. This is, this is, I've never seen this work out well. I have heard of stories where, where a non-Christian, where they've missionary dated, like non-Christian meets non-Christian. Oh, they come to faith later on. I've heard stories like that. I have never seen stories like that. It's like theoretically possible, like it's theoretically possible, like it's, it's possible to jump out of a second story window and live. Doesn't mean it's a good idea. It's a sin. It's a grievous sin before the Lord. So if you're younger and you're looking for a, a spouse, or if you're an older, if you're a parent, and you're looking uh, and you're guiding your children on whom they should marry, whom they should date, whom they should even have... I would even open this up to other un, other unbreakable-ish rec, uh, relationships with, with non-Christians. I would give them caution. I would say, yeah, you shouldn't marry. I think Christians, this is a side note too, I think Christians, especially with the unequally yoking with non-believers, I think we should be careful on who even we enter into business dealings with. Not because, not because there's anything wrong to go and have these on something, but you have a completely different set of ethics if you're a Christian than your non-Christian neighbor or your non-Christian business partner. Like, you really should be careful on who you enter into, not, into binding relationships with. Now, Ezra does something very cool here too. He remembers the justice of God. He remembers the justice of God. He makes an unre he asks a few really important questions in 14 and 15. And then he points and makes application to the justice of God. He says in 14, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Right? Should we, the, shall we do this? The answer is no. Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor any escape? Now, these questions are a logical progression, right? These questions are a logical progression that could be stated in a different way. I'm going to logically do this. Let's change these from a questions to a statement, like a logical syllogism, right? That's a $10 word that just means setting up something in, lo in, in logical argument. If we break your commands and intermarry with pagans, right? That's verse 14, portion of verse 14. And the second part, you will be angry with us and consume us so that there will be none of us left. God will judge his people. God will judge his people. We cannot walk in sin, brothers and sisters, and not expect the justice of God. We cannot expect the justice of God. God takes his holiness and the holiness of his people very seriously. God takes the holiness of his people so seriously that he, uh, there is no way for us to be holy in and of ourselves, right? You know how we're holy before the Lord? I've been pointing this whole sermon toward this. You know how we're holy before the Lord? The finished work of Jesus Christ in our place and for our sins. There's a point here to be made that God takes the holiness of his people so, so importantly that he sends his sons, he sends his son, not son, son one, to make us holy. Jesus, who lived a perfect life, died a brutal death in our place and for our sins so that we might repent, might turn from sin, turn toward the cross. We might become righteous before the Lord with, through him. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. 
God takes the holiness of his people very seriously. So much so that he sent his only son to live a perfect life, die a brutal death in our place and for our sins. If when you see sin in the Old Testament, right? We're seeing this here. We're seeing Ezra being broken down, praying about the sins of, his, sins of the people. Let's not have a haughty, prideful thing. These are idiots. But let's humbly come before the Lord and say, you know what? If not for the grace of God, there go I. There go I. Because of the finished work of Christ in my place and for my sins, who gave me a new heart, new mind, new, new, new soul, and a new family. So if you're here today, you're here today and you don't know Jesus. You're here today and you're like, I hear a lot of the holiness of God. I hear a lot of God taking holiness seriously. I hear that God is, God is holy and I know I'm not. And you just explained the gospel to me, Pastor John. If this is your first time hearing this message... Today is the day. Repent and believe. Turn away from your sin. Trust in the finished work of Christ in your place and for your sins on your behalf. Let's pray, brothers and sisters. Lord Jesus, you're gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, you lived a perfect life, died a brutal death in our place and for our sins. And Lord, I pray that we would be broken, broken for our sins, broken about the sins of our people, sins of... And Lord, I pray that as we're broken, we would come to you. And Lord, we would come and seek wisdom. We would come and seek uh, your forgiveness. And Lord, we would be bold proclaimers of your forgiveness to the world and to the people. It's in your good name, Lord. Amen.
One real quick announcement, brothers and sisters, before we dismiss. So next week, Sunday, September 4th, we have a, a welcome for Rob and Alyssa for their new son, Robert, during the coffee time. Uh, we will be having cake during the coffee time. And if you would like to throw, uh, like a shower, bring a shower gift for them, she's registered at Bye Bye Baby, just letting you guys know for next week. But with our text, Jude 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority before all times, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we dismiss, go serve your king. Thank you.